Hi, Rev Scott here, and today we're going to be looking at the wonderful, wonderful city of Smyrna. And it's quite an important thing to do, this, this background to each church, because churches don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a particular place, and sometimes it's quite interesting to study the relationship between the church and the place. Like, for example, your church, where it is now, how is it received by the community? Is it kind of welcomed in the center of community? Is it hated by the community? Is it ignored by the community? Or is it a little bit mocked by the um, uh, community? You know, people go, oh, it's the church. Yes, we, we put up with it, you know. Now, to understand Smyrna is to understand that Smyrna as a city, even today, is now Izmir, right, is a fantastic place. I haven't had the privilege of being there, but it was considered not the business center but the second city a lovely and beautiful place it's 35 miles north of Ephesus and it even today it's really difficult because as we try and study this church uh, and and the city we can't get to all the ruins because there's an actual city called Izmir on top of it and so at the moment um, at the time of, of of writing the city would have been about a hundred thousand people right and um, Historical commentators say it was the most splendid of the seven cities. It had a very varied and vibrant religious life in the center of uh, Smyrna. There were temples to Athena, Cybele, Zeus, Hestia, Hermes, Dionysus, Eros, Heracles. The river Meles, or Meles, uh, which travels through there, was worshipped as a deity. There was a, a temple to the emperor and there was a temple to Rome itself. And so around about 197 um, BC, it was part of the Pergamum kingdom. And we'll get to Pergamum a bit later. And it appealed to Rome for help and, and broke away. And that caused it to be a very, very Roman church. They, they wanted to identify themselves with Rome. And so they appealed um, and established a temple to Deo Romia. Uh, Ro Roma, the personification of Rome. So it worshipped Rome. Rome was a really big thing. And it was th this temple was dedicated and built in Smyrna. And so incredibly pa patriotic towards Rome and very defensive against all who opposed Rome. And this will have a direct impact on the church itself. Around the year AD 25, there was a contest between 25 cities competing for the right to build an emperor, a temple for the Emperor Tiberius, right? And only Smyrna was allowed to do that. So it was a great privilege and honor to them at the time and meant that people had to go once a year and take a pinch of incense and offer it at that temple and utter the phrase, Caesar is Lord. And when that happened, they were marked on their hand or on their forehead with a, a kind of ash and, and, and something to, to make sure that it stayed on for a while. We kind of think of this in terms of elections in South Africa. We mark the thumb with a black cokey and it takes a couple of days to, to kind of wear off. And this is quite interesting because in South Africa, if you don't vote, you're seen as part of the problem, not part of the solution. And so in Smyrna, when people didn't go and offer their praises to, uh, uh, to, to the emperor, they were then ridiculed and ostracized by the community. Now, the Jewish people, and it was a very big Jewish center, the Jewish people had certain things that were abhorrent to them because of their Jewishness. They would not serve in the army of Rome, and they would not offer to worship Caesar because they had their own God. They were a monotheistic religion. They had petitioned Rome and been given privileges on both those accounts. And so they could not participate in this, this worship, but nobody would ostracize them. Now, to understand Christianity, Christianity was a Jewish cult. It was an offshoot of Judaism. And so for the first couple of um, decades, there was this relationship where it was seen as a type of Judaism, a type of Judaism where they believe that the Messiah has come. And the Jews in this particular town, um, city were very, very proud of their relationship with Rome that gave them exemption and all these different things. 
the Christian then tried to claim the same exemption because they too did not want to serve in the army because of their religious beliefs and they too worshipped only one God and therefore could not also bow down to um, Rome. The Jewish people made sure that Rome were absolutely certain that the Christians were no longer Jews. And so it was particularly cruel. And, and although this sounds very anti-Semitic, I've got many Jewish friends and, and, and today we're so careful about these things. But in this particular place and time in history, the Jewish people were very, very cruel to the Christian church. They saw it as not somebody who believed slightly differently, but as somebody that they really, really hated and um, made sure that they were uh, excluded from this. So the church would have suffered quite greatly or had to compromise on their beliefs. And so the church would have not been celebrated by the um, city because of their lack of patriotism. And many even saw that as treason and so would cut them off from social and economic life and find ways to ostracize the Christians, even sometimes including death. And so you get a, a picture of all these temples and all these things and Christianity is struggling to fit into this place because they will not compromise. Now, I want to take you a little bit back into some of the history because the very name of the town has so much meaning. The city of Smyrna gets its name from a Cypriot legend right, around the wife of King Siniras, King of Cyprus, who foolishly claimed that her daughter Mira, M-Y-R-R-H-A, also known as Smyrna, was more beautiful than Aphrodite herself. And this so enraged the goddess, and this is the, the legend, that she made Smyrna fall in love with her own father. And one night, after Smyrna's nurse made the king a drink, uh, drunk, she climbed into his bed, and when he finally woke up from his drunken slumber, the king drew his sword and drove his daughter out of that place and pursued her into the countryside. The legend continues to say, just as he was about to overtake and kill her with his sword, Aphrodite took pity on the girl and turned her into a myrrh tree. Right? Myrrh is something we know and a lot from the story of Jesus, isn't it? And so when the king came, he, with his king, uh, with his sword, he descended and he split that myrrh tree. And out of that tumbled Adonis. So Adonis was born from Mira, right, or Smyrna. And so it's a tragic story, and it, it speaks of a lot of, of pain and suffering. And this is the thing, deep in the history is so much about how that story comes to life. Even in this, you will see names that are associated with stories we know, like Troy. Okay, Siniras was a ruler in Cyprus who... Um, gave special gifts to Agamemnon right, uh, when he heard that the Greeks were going to uh, sail to Troy. So it all kind of starts to interact, interact. Now this is quite important because the name Smyrna or Myrrh means bitter. And it's the name given to a resin that is used in, in different fragrance things and sacrifice. But we know that word quite well from Scripture. We know that when the Wise men came from the east. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was a very strange thing to give to a baby because it was associated with bitterness and it was associated with death. It was a burial herb. And so to give this to Mary was symbolic of her recognizing that to be a mother would cause her much, much pain. In fact, the word Mary comes from the same root word. Mary and even Martha, who we see in Scripture. Bitterness. Bitterness. When Jesus was given something to drink on the cross, it was a bitter something. It was myrrh that he was given. And he didn't want to drink it. Even when the Israelites were traveling from Egypt through the desert, they came to a place with water and they found the water was bitter. And so they couldn't drink it. And so they called the place Mara. 
Now my pronunciation might be totally off, but you see how it's an important message for Christians to understand that all Christians will be persecuted. All Christians will have to endure some bitter, bitter things to remain faithful to the Lord. And so the story of this little uh, city is one of bitterness for the church. As we start to study the church next week, you will see that incredible pain from following Jesus. And I want to fast forward a little bit to a very, very important character in the early church, a man by the name of Polycarp. He was the Bishop of Smyrna. And so around 50 years after the writing of Revelation, uh, Polycarp was an apprentice to John. And he was martyred in Smyrna in 155 AD. And this serves uh, as a real example of what John is talking about and what was actually happening in this place. So on the 23rd of February, 19, uh, 155 AD, he was brought before the proconsul in the city amphitheater and was told, curse Jesus and live or confess Jesus and die. He responded, 86 years have I served Christ and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme the king who saved me? He was sentenced to death and um, the Jews in that town were at the forefront of the execution. They shouted the loudest for him to be thrown to the lions and then when he was condemned to be burned alive, they went and collected the timber and were in the forefront of making that pyre, even though it was a Sabbath and so it was illegal for them to do that. So there was a real bitter hatred between the Christians and the Jews in this place. Polycarp asked not to be fast fastened to the stake and prayed, O Lord Almighty, God, Father, and your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, through him we have come to know you. I thank you for counting me worthy this day and hour of sharing the cup among the number of your many martyrs. The fire took its time and he was suffering. And so a soldier put an end to his suffering with a sword. And so if you look at the story, it's a very tragic story. And it's a story of a hero who stood firm on what he believed. And so as we look in our communities, are we embracing the community and in some ways compromising our faith? Are we standing firm and enduring suffering for being a Christian? How are we impacting the communities that we're in? Churches are there to challenge a culture and show them a different way. And churches are Christians, groups of Christians. And so I ask you today to spend this time just understanding not just a relationship between Smyrna, the church, the Romans, the Jews, the different temples, but your own story. Where are you? What are the challenges to the Christian faith? Who are those that would support the Christian faith? And will you be faithful even to the end? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing and wonderful church, for a story that inspires us, and we should be making poems and singing songs about the loyal Christians in this place. And Lord, as we seek to study more next time, we want to pray and thank you for people like Polycarp, who have been faithful to the end and shown us the way. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Before you go, uh, just to share that this is a project that I'm working on and a project that I'm inviting you to participate in. I will be online tomorrow um, at 7.30, uh, the 28th of um, May, uh, doing a little bit of a discussion. But also, I would invite you to make comments uh, on this, to share this and use it in Bible studies and personal study as you read the scripture for yourself and discover the most amazing story of the book of Revelation. God bless.